Father, what a wonderful reminder of your love for us and that you are the great creator God. You, you're the one that gives us hope. Yeah, our hope is in your name. Our hope is in you. You are the one who speaks all things into creation, including ourselves, Father. We are, we are created to be in your image. So, Father, as we, as we gather today to look at your word, would you just teach us uh, your word? Would you bless us with the understanding? Open our hearts and minds. And, Father, use my voice to speak your word. But, Father, truly, we want you to send your son, Jesus, to teach us what these words mean in our lives today. That's a blessing we ask and thank you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody, and happy Sunday to you. It is June 13th, Sunday, and welcome to our uh, YouTube channel, In His Grace Community Church. I am Pastor Grant Forsyth, and we're going to spend a little time today in God's Word, and hopefully you'll be encouraged uh, and tested too, but also encouraged by what God tells us today. Our readings today is going to come out of Paul's letter to uh, the First Corinthians. And uh, in this letter, uh, Paul is going to uh, address some of the problems. And the church in Corinth had a few problems that Paul had to address. And uh, one of them happened to be, for example, division, because uh, the people were kind of latching on to uh, who sounded good. Uh, who had the best message, or how they put it. And they, they tended to gravitate towards people that uh, just had a lot of wisdom because that was really important to them in that day. If you sounded wise, maybe you knew what you were talking about. And so Paul is uh, addressing that problem in this uh, very first chapter of his letter and kind of sets the tone for the rest of the letter. But anyways, when we get down to... Uh, verse uh, 17, where we're going to break into, Paul begins to talk about a concept that we need to think about today. And it has, happens to do with our wisdom in comparison to God's wisdom. And there is no comparison. And I think you probably know that. But we're going to dig into that and see some examples of why that uh, concept uh, is so true that God's wisdom is so much greater than our own. Okay, we're going to get into that. And uh, as we do, <clears throat> we're going to cover a few things along the way. So let's get started. Paul here, in, in uh, starting in verse 17, he starts to talk about his part in this process because there have been other teachers that have come along. And uh, he's going to talk about where he is in this, in this conversation of different teachers who sound wise and eloquent and so forth. All right. He starts out by saying this, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. <clears throat> send him. That's what apostle means, sent forth. And he was sent, but he wasn't sent to, to baptize. That wasn't his ministry. His ministry was to preach the gospel. The message of Jesus, that's what he was called to do, is to spread that word. But how do you do that? Well, he says to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence. Paul was not an eloquent speaker. Um, he didn't sound wise. He, you know, he wasn't a trained speaker. For what we know about Paul, he was an academic, so he knew his scriptures really well. He knew the Old Testament backwards and forwards. Uh, but as far as a speaker, he apparently was not a very impressive speaker. But that's okay, because what Paul is saying here is that he came to preach the gospel not with eloquence, not with wisdom, a whole vocabulary of fine-sounding words. No. Lest the cross of Christ, which is the message, be emptied of its power. In other words, if, if he was an eloquent speaker, maybe people would just kind of look at him, look to him, trust in Paul, and it's not that. He wants them to trust in the message because it's the message that has power. And you've heard me say that before, um, that, that it, 
Scripture is very clear that there's power in the words of the gospel. And that's comforting because for us today, it isn't how well you say it. It's not uh, how convincing you can be if you're talking to somebody about Jesus or the gospel. It's not that at all. The, the power is in, in the gospel words. God will take it from there. Okay, and Paul is kind of relieved that the power is in the gospel and not in his ability to speak because he was not a very impressive speaker. All right, so he's laying out his part in all of this. For the message of the cross, the message of the cross, that's the gospel, that Jesus as God became a man, which is something that just sounds preposterous to many people in his day and to many today. And then dies on a cross, right? The message of the cross, it sounded like a bunch of nonsense. The message of the cross is foolishness. It's just a bunch of foolishness to those who are perishing. So he's talking about a particular group of people here, isn't he? To the people who are perishing. Now he's not saying to the people who will perish or ultimately will end up perishing. He's not saying that. What he is saying is that the, there's, there's a journey. We're on a journey. And one direction is toward perishing. You're, you're actually walking away from God. All right? And that's what he calls this road to our perishing because he gives this contrast here. Okay? He says who are. This is a present day. He's not saying who will ultimately, right? But then he says this, but to us who are, see again, present day, present uh, words, to us who are being saved, again, the journey that we're on is a journey toward God. The other direction is a journey away from God called perishing. It's a journey. It's a direction. That you're moving. You're, you're either moving toward God or you're moving away from him. There's no like rest stop. Okay. You're either. You're moving in one direction or the other. And so he says. Those who are being saved. To us who are being saved. It is the power of God. The message of the cross. That's right. The message of the cross. Is the power of God. Not in your words, not in your eloquence, not in your wisdom. <clears throat> okay? Now, we're going to jump ahead to verse 21. We'll come back to the, the perishing thing. Okay? For since the wisdom of God, the wisdom of God, he's going to start comparing the two wisdoms, God's wisdom and ours. For since the wisdom of God in the world, through its wisdom, did not know him. So he's comparing the wisdom of God and the wisdom of the world through its wisdom did not know him. You cannot know God through the wisdom of the world. It's pretty clear. And we see that played out in several places. This is one of them. You're not going to discover God through your own wisdom, your own study, academics, reasoning. All right, you're just not. It's the wisdom of God is how you know him, know who God is, know his plan. It comes from the wisdom of God, not our own wisdom. All right, God was pleased. You want to know what pleases God? Well, here it is. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached. And you could probably put that in air quotes, the foolishness of what was preached in some people's minds, right? To save those who believe. To save those who believe. So what pleases God? Those who believe. Believe the message of the cross. It's a powerful message. There's power in the message. And God is pleased to save those who believe. That's the road towards being saved. See, Paul uses that expression in a couple different ways. Uh, in one place he says where you have been saved. In this place he calls it you are being saved. 
talking about the journey. And in another place, he calls it, you will be saved. So depending on the context of what he's talking about, in this particular case, he's talking about the journey that we're on. We are being saved, okay? And God is pleased to save those who believe. Who believe in the message of the cross. That doesn't make sense to us with human wisdom, human reasoning. This doesn't even make any sense, all right? Jews demand signs. Boy, we saw that in the Gospels, didn't we? The Jews are always asking Jesus for a sign, and a lot of times it was after some great miracle. <laughs> They're still looking for a sign that he's the Messiah, right? The Jews demand signs. The Greeks look for wisdom because that, to them, that was the thing. Wisdom was the virtue that gave you the credibility that you knew what you were talking about. All right, that was really important to them. That's what they're looking for. But we, but we preach Christ crucified, which if you just stop and look at that, it sounds like an oxymoron, doesn't it? Moron. Um, Christ, Messiah, God in the flesh, crucified. <laughs> okay, that doesn't sound powerful, does it? Crucified is weakness, Crucified as being defeated. No. In this case, it's not. But human reasoning, human wisdom would tell us that doesn't make any sense at all. That's a bunch of foolishness. But Paul says, but we preach Christ crucified, our Christ, our Messiah, our Savior crucified. A stumbling block to the Jews, they cannot get past that. The Jews of that day, I mean, obviously, the, the church started out with Jewish believers, so there were obviously some. But by and large, the Jewish people, they couldn't get over it. It was a stumbling block to them. And foolishness to the Gentiles, that's, that's the most foolish thing they ever heard of. Didn't make sense that God would, first of all, become flesh, so that he could go to the cross. And what they didn't see is the victory or the power of that. The power of defeating death. The power of defeating sin. The power of bringing a new creation through the resurrection. They couldn't see that. They were blinded to it. All right. But to those whom God has called. Okay. Well that opens up a whole new question now doesn't it? To those who are called. What does it mean to be called? Hmm. Well, we'll get into that in a moment. To those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, in other words, this calling has gone out to Jews and to Greeks, Christ, Christ, the power of God. You see, the, the message of the cross is not defeat. The message of the cross is that what Christ did is actually the power of God to reform, redeem humanity, recreate a new creation and the wisdom of God. Jesus is both. He's the power of God and he's also the wisdom of God. Even though in our own human wisdom we can't quite see that. All right? This is what Paul is addressing when he's comparing the wisdom of God Versus our own wisdom and what we look for. <clears throat> for the foolishness of God, put that in air quotes again, the foolishness of God in some people's minds, is wiser than human wisdom. Yeah. And the weakness of God, dying on a cross, sounds weak, is stronger than human strength. Because of not understanding what that dying on the cross really meant. Okay, and what it means. Okay, I want to go back to this verse here. We covered it once, but I want to go back and, and look at it again. It's just foolishness, this message of the cross. It's just a bunch of foolishness to those who are perishing. You look, if you're walking away from God, you don't understand it. You can't see it. It just sounds like a bunch of foolishness. And we were maybe that way one day. Okay, or we certainly know people that, fall into that category? Christianity? 
just a bunch of foolishness. It's 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 old and dark and 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 not very enlightening and 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 not very wise. It's foolishness, right? To those who are perishing, they're walking away from God. That doesn't mean they ultimately will. It just simply means they're on a different path. But to those who are being saved, it's the power of God. We see it as something opposite than foolishness. We see it as very powerful. Very powerful. The whole thing about our perishing or our being saved, those two things, I think we want to look at that a little, little deeper. Okay, We want to go and explore that. And Paul uh, addresses it again. But we got to jump over to 2 Corinthians. Uh, he doesn't uh, make that as clear here, but he adds something in his second letter to uh, the Corinthians and happens to be in 2 Corinthians 4. He talks about this concept again uh, a second time, all right, in similar circumstances. And we're going to learn a couple more things from it. Okay, chapter 4, verse 3, he says, And even if our gospel, you know, the message of the cross... That's foolishness, right? Even if our gospel is veiled, veiled, covered over, okay, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Do you see the similarity in the language that he's using here? To those who are walking away from God, they're not believing this, and it seems like they can't believe it. All right. Well, it's veiled. It's kind of like, it's there, okay? There is, a, the gospel message has gone out. It's just that it's covered over. It's veiled. So you can't quite see it. And so people that are moving away from God and not believing, they don't see it because it's covered up. How does it get covered up? Well, the God of this age, the God of this age, which is the accuser, the enemy of God, Satan, the devil. He is the God of this age. Okay, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. That's how it's veiled. It's not that the message has to go out and God has to um, surgically present the message here, here, and here. It's out there. It's just that it's veiled. And people can't see it. And what has happened is the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. If you know people that can't quite see the concept here of the message and the power of the cross, there is a blindness that takes place that is covering over this gospel message, the message of the cross. And so people aren't believing it. Now that sounds kind of defeated, doesn't it? It sounds like, wow, that's kind of depressing. Well, hang on. There's an answer coming, okay? The power of God is coming. We're going to see it. But right now, we're talking about it's the, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers, right? This is what he's done. So that they cannot see the light of the gospel. Notice he's using the concept now of light. And he says you cannot see the light of the gospel. They're blinded to it. It's not that the gospel message isn't there. They just can't see it. It's been covered over. It's been veiled. And so people aren't responding to it. All right? They cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ. Remember we said earlier, you cannot know God, see God, without the wisdom of God, without this message, the message of the cross. It displays the glory of Christ. You can't see the glory of Christ. The, the, the message of the cross is the glory of Christ, not the defeat of Christ. It's actually the power and the glory of Christ who is the image of God. Christ is the image of God, but you can't see that when you are blinded to it. Now that sounds kind of defeating, doesn't it? What do we do about that? Well, it isn't what do we do about it. What does God do about it, right? He goes on, he says, for what we preach, you know, the gospel message, the message of the cross, for what we preach is not ourselves. You see, it's not about you. It's not about me. 
It's not about how wise or how eloquent or what vocabulary or how passionate you present it. If it's veiled, people aren't going to see it anyways. But if God wants it to be unveiled, he will. It's not about you or I. It's not about ourselves. But Jesus Christ as Lord, that's what it's about. It's about Jesus Christ as Lord. As Lord. And ourselves, Paul speaking of himself and the other leaders and the other church leaders and evangelists, ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. Notice that Paul doesn't put himself in a position uh, above them. In fact, he calls himself and those traveling with him, he calls, he calls themselves servants. Servants, your servants, right? For Jesus' sake. Uh, that's a humble uh, and proper way to put that. All right? This Jesus Christ as Lord, um, that's what we preach. And a couple weeks ago, uh, I think it was a couple weeks ago, I talked to you about the kingdom of God. And when we talked about the kingdom of God, we saw how Jesus was presenting the kingdom of God. It wasn't so much, how are we going to get to heaven? His message was more about the kingdom of God. And what he was trying to stress is not a place so much or um, some kind of a, an experience. The word kingdom means sovereignty. It means royal power and sovereignty over your life. And so I think we asked then, is Jesus your Lord? Right? So I can ask you now, is Jesus your Lord? Because Paul is incorporating this into the conversation. Is Jesus Christ as Lord, okay, and ourselves as the servants for Jesus' sake? So in that message a couple of weeks ago, when we looked at that word kingdom, that's what it meant. Sovereignty of God. Is he your Lord? So when I ask you, is Jesus your Lord? You might just say, well, yes, of course he's my Lord. Okay? Well, we're going to test that. We're going to test that at, towards the end of this message. And you might learn something about that. Because this whole thing about our wisdom versus God's wisdom is going to show us something as to whether or not Jesus really is your Lord. I'm not saying that in a um, condemning way. I'm just Let's, let's, let's be convicted of, uh, of what Jesus is truly doing here. And what do we know that he is doing in order to be able to call him our Lord. So notice how Paul frames this, right? After saying that the message of the cross has been veiled, but to us, it's Jesus Christ as Lord. Okay, see the two sides? All right, so in verse 6, we're going to get to what God does. Yes, it's been veiled. Yes, the God of this age has tried to cover it up. But he, he doesn't have the power to keep it that way, does he? Because God is sovereign, and he has all power. So what does God do? Well, here it comes. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness. Notice there again, we're using light. Light of the gospel? Well, remember during creation, God simply spoke and things happened. Creation happened and he spoke and he said, let light shine. He simply said, let the light shine and it did. Okay, because the power of God and his creation. You know, the video we watched at the opening, you know, God declared the heavens to be. He placed things where they go. He is the creator God. He simply spoke. And light, light is what resulted, as, uh, among many other things. Let light shine out of darkness. Remember that, he says? Well, it's God that's doing it. This is something that we do. This is something where we apply our own wisdom. We're going to talk about what God does. He speaks creation, didn't he? Well, God made his light shine in our hearts. God made his light shine 
in our hearts. I, I guess we would love to be able to say that we did something and then the light came. The truth of the matter is, God is the one who speaks. God is the one who shines his light into your heart. And he may be doing that right now. He is doing that right now in your life. Uh, maybe he has done it for a long time, or maybe he's doing it for the first time today in your life. Either way, it's God that's doing it. We have to recognize that. He pierces through the, the, the veil. His light pierces through that blindness that the enemy, the God of this age, tries to cover up. God pierces right through that. He's the one that does that. All right. It's not that he has to surgically figure out who to call at any what time. No, the calling is there. The gospel's gone out. It's just that it's been veiled. And God reveals it by piercing it with his light into your heart. That's how it happens. Not through your wisdom. Not through your actions. But God makes this happen. That's a powerful thing when you think about it. He made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light. To give it to us. To give us the light. Of the knowledge of God's glory. Is wisdom and knowledge important? Yes. It's his knowledge, his wisdom that he shares with us. The knowledge of God's glory. You can't see God's glory without his light shining into your heart. Okay? Of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. That, these verses sound very similar to what we read earlier, doesn't it? Yeah. We can't know God without the wisdom of God, without the light piercing through the blindness, piercing through the veil, right into your heart. It's kind of interesting. I, I, I think about Paul in his calling. You know, he was an enemy of God. And he was called Saul, Saul of Tarsus. And he was on his way to arrest Christians, if you know the story. Well, what did God do? He pierced <laughs> with his light. He used light to literally knock him down. In fact, it was so bright that Paul experienced blindness. Blindness that he had to be healed from. He couldn't do anything until God healed him by sending Ananias to him to pray and ask him to be healed. But notice it was light that pierced into Saul's life. Saul became Paul who's writing this letter. So it's kind of interesting this whole idea of light shining because Paul knows all about that one. And believe me, it wasn't his wisdom. In fact, he was working against God. But God's calling on his life included light, didn't it? So it's kind of reminiscent. I think maybe Paul is reminiscing here about the, old, the light that knocked him down. It was so bright, right? He made his light shine in our hearts. And boy, does Paul know what that feels like. He knows that experience. So this calling, we, we, we saw that earlier about being called. The calling of God isn't something that he's, you know, in, in Saul's life it was strategic because God had a special mission for him. But today the calling has gone out. It has gone out. It's gone out into the world. The, the message of the cross has gone out and I realize there's some regions that um, we've not been able to reach yet. But by and large a good majority of the world, this calling has gone out. It's just that the gospel is veiled by the enemy. Okay? But that's temporary. See, because God pierces right through that. He shines the light right through, right into the hearts of, of your heart. You don't do it. God does it. God does it. He pierces through into your heart. He has either done it in a particular moment in your life. I've also heard people say that they've grown up with these things in their heart all of their life. I don't know. I guess everyone's experience might be a little bit different. 
I can tell you my experience, and I shared this at our testimony night. Uh, what we do in the summer is, uh, well, this would have been a week ago, uh, Friday, uh, but the first Friday of each month out here on our East Lawn, we have a, t a time called um, Stories on the East Lawn. We share our testimonies of where God has touched us in life, where, we, you know, God sightings, where did God show up in our lives. And we, we had a really great time doing that. The first Friday of, of uh, each month at 630 on the East Lawn. That's what we do out here, and I'll talk about that at the announcement time. But anyways, I was sharing with uh, those who came, I was sharing with them the story of when I was getting prepared for baptism. And um, I thought I had all the bases covered, right? I mean, I, I've been raised in a home that honored God and honored scripture and knew Jesus is Savior. We didn't have everything figured out. You know, we never really do. We're still learning, okay? But by and large, I knew all these things. And, and uh, so when it came time for me to decide to be baptized, I think I was 20, 23 years old. And I said, you know, it's time to be baptized. I've done all these other things. I should be baptized. And so when I went to my pastor to ask him about it, and we talked for a while, he told me that I wasn't ready to be baptized. And I got to tell you, that really floored me. What do you mean I'm not ready to be baptized? What else do I got to do? I was raised understanding many of these principles, okay, maybe there's more things I got to learn, but man, what do I got to do to get ready to be baptized? I know a lot of stuff. <laughs> and it really wasn't until, uh, and I remember this moment very, very vividly, it wasn't until I was, this was probably a couple weeks after the pastor told me I wasn't ready, it wasn't until I, I was sitting there with the materials, I put them down and I says, you know, and I started praying to God and I said, Lord, I don't know what you want from me. What do you want? I don't know what you want. And then it occurred to me, maybe that's the point. I don't know. Is that okay? Hmm. And I began to pray a prayer that came from the Spirit. It didn't come from me. I know this, and I'll explain why I know this in a minute. But I began to pray to God, and I said, Lord, I don't know what you want. I don't know what you want me to do. I don't know what you want me to do next week or next year or in the future. I don't know. But whatever it is, whatever it is you decide that you want me to do, I will do it. Whatever it is. I don't even know what it is yet. But when it comes along and you show me what you want me to do, I will do it. Well, I got to tell you, that was a big change for me because that was a prayer of surrender. That's what I was missing. Surrender. Submitting to God's will in my life, whatever that is. Now, I know that those words did not come from me, my wisdom, all right? Because as soon as I said that, I immediately said, whoa, what did I just say? It was like I was going to try to grab those words and pull them back. Was, Wait a minute. What did I just tell God? What if he wants me to do something crazy like Go to a foreign nation and starve with the people or, or maybe he's going to want me to do something that I, I just, maybe he wants me to live a life of poverty. Maybe, maybe he wants me to do something really crazy like one day be a pastor. <laughs> okay, I threw that one in. I didn't think of that. I just threw that one in. Uh, because being a pastor was the furthest thing from my mind at that point. But it was the idea it was surrender. That's what was missing. And in a way, what I was really saying was, um, I want Jesus to be my Lord. I want him to direct my life, his will, my, not mine, his wisdom, not my wisdom. My wisdom's foolishness. And so I say that because 
it's in that moment that I believe that the light of God was shining into my heart, okay, and enlightening me to his will. And that was a particular moment, and I remember it vividly. And I think that people that grow up in the church or they grow up from childhood, they still need to have some kind of a surrender. For me, that was my surrender. So the calling, I've known these things in my life. I mean, I knew things. I knew stuff, right? But it's not about knowing stuff, is it? No. God shines the light through into our hearts. He does it. Until then, we're kind of blinded in a way. Even, even growing up Christian, there's a certain amount of blindness, isn't there? He shines the light into our hearts. We do not. It's not our wisdom, is it? Okay. What do we do? Okay. We do have a response. And I'm going to cover that next. But God shines the light in. Okay. I want to wrap this part of it up by going back now to 1 Corinthians 1. But this time, we're going to start from verse 1. In Paul's opening verses here, in his saying hello to the Corinthians and saying things about himself, he says some really important things that we tend to read right over. We tend to read over it and think nothing of it and not even realize the power of what he said. We're going to do that right now. Verse 1 of chapter 1, his greeting to the Corinthians, he says something very profound. He says, Paul, he identifies him as writer, called, yes, he was called, to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. That was his calling, and boy, does he remember it well. He was called to a special mission, right? By the will of God, not his will, not his wisdom, it was God's idea. Saul, who became Paul, didn't get himself right with God. In fact, he was fighting against God. In fact, he was on the road to perishing, really, and he didn't even know it. But God struck him down with light, didn't he? So he says, Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, his will, and our brother Sosthenes. Sosthenes is a synagogue leader, uh, I believe from Corinth, that was traveling with Paul at that moment as he's writing this letter back to the Corinthians. Sosthenes was with him and evidently helping him with this letter, right? So he's, he's, this is his greeting, right? To the church of God in Corinth, he's addressing the church, this is who I'm writing to. To those sanctified, that means set apart by the Holy Spirit, believers that have been called and have received the call and accepted the call, so they're set apart by the Holy Spirit. They are now sanctified, they're believers, in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people, right? They were called to, to be his holy people. There's a calling that goes out, right? They were called to be his holy people together with all those everywhere. Now he's including everybody, right? Who call, in other words, they call, they call out now on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Do you understand what he just said? They're talking about answering the call. The calling is there. We decide, do we want to answer the call? And when we do, we're calling on Jesus as our Lord. Jesus is your Lord. That's, that's how we answer, through belief. Okay, that's answering the call. God shines the light to our hearts. We don't. But what do we do? Well, we call on the Lord Jesus as Lord, that's what kingdom means, 
Okay? In other words, we return the call. <laughs> God calls us. <laughs> we return the call. But when we return the call, we're calling out to Jesus as our Lord. That's how we respond. We call back. Okay? God calls. We call back. He shines his light into our hearts. And then we call Jesus our Lord. That seems to be the thing that we do on the road toward being saved instead of the road to perishing. We call on the Lord, as Jesus as Lord. Okay? So that's what he's saying in this verse, verse 2. There's a lot here. Okay? Then, we get to things like this. And I'm going to test you on this. Because I, I, I asked you before, is Jesus your Lord? And you might have said, well, yeah, Jesus is my Lord. Okay. Well, let's test this out, shall we? How about this one? Have you ever thought this? Why doesn't God shine his light on so-and-so? Why doesn't he do that? It might be somebody in your life that's important to you. He shined his light into your life. You called him back by saying, Jesus, you're my Lord. But then you wonder, well, why, why doesn't God shine his light on this other person that I'm praying for? Why doesn't he shine it into their life? Why isn't he doing it right now? God, I don't understand why you're not doing that. And what we're really saying, if you complete the sentence, let's complete it now by saying this, Lord, why, why, doesn't, why don't you, why doesn't God shine your light on this person? Because that's what I would do. That's what I would do. Oh, really? Is your wisdom greater than God's wisdom? How about this one? Why doesn't God heal so-and-so? I've prayed for them. I've done everything I know to do. Why isn't God, why is he letting this happen? Or maybe it's me. Why doesn't God heal me? I don't understand why God's not healing me. Why doesn't he heal? Why doesn't he heal this person? Because that's what I would do. Oh, really? Okay. I think God knows your desire, but you mean if you were God, that's what you would do? Interesting concept. Why isn't God fixing this problem? Why is he letting this situation go on? How can God possibly stand by and watch while this horrible thing is happening? Why isn't he fixing it? Because that's what I would do. You know, we make the mistake. We make the mistake sometimes of thinking that God is just like us, only better. Or that God thinks the way that we think about things, only more perfect. Or that God is like us except he doesn't, he doesn't sin. Or he's like us except he's powerful, but he's like us. And if I'm made in the image of God, that means that I think along the same lines as God thinks. And that's not true. God never said that we would be that way. Yet sometimes I think we have a concept of God that he's like us, only better. And we, we run the risk of making God in our image. Making God, forming him into what we think God is like. That's human wisdom. In fact, that's a perfect definition of idolatry. We're forming God into our image. Because those are the things that I would do. Why wouldn't God do it? It's a very dangerous thing to do that. Because what you're really saying is 
I'm the Lord. Jesus isn't the Lord. That, that the things that I'm saying aren't just suggestions, or maybe they are just suggestions, that God should probably do this because that's what I would do. And um, yeah, that's human wisdom. We don't know why God decides the way he decides. We don't know why he decides who he will shine the light on. It has to do with timing. It has to do with his will. If there has to be a reason that God uses. The calling has gone out. It's just that he decides when he's going to shine that light into a person's heart. And it's according to his will and according to his plan as to when he's going to do that. It's not up to us. And when we try to apply what we think God should do, what we're saying is, well, we're denying that Jesus is our Lord is what we're doing. Because we're not accepting his will. Either in your life or in someone else's life. Okay? So what are we supposed to do about that? When we have someone in our life that we just don't understand why God is not opening up their hearts, their minds, their understanding. If he's, if he's touching your heart today and you're tr struggling trying to figure out why isn't he doing someone else's heart, I don't understand because that's what I would do. God does not want us to be anxious about those things. He wants us to trust him. That's why he's our Lord. If he truly is your Lord, then you would trust him with his wisdom and his reasons, his will, his timing, and not our own. Okay? So how are we supposed to manage that? Does it, are we supposed to live lives of anxiousness and fear and worry about people in our lives or about our own life? And the answer comes here. In verse 3, again, we're in the opening verses of 1 Corinthians 1. Paul gives us the answer. And many times we just go, we blow right past it. And we have no idea what Paul just said. Well, we're going to check it out today. Because this is how we're supposed to live our lives. Even though we worry about others, right? Paul says this, after the greetings, after his hellos, after his... You know, talking about his calling, he says this. Grace, grace, and peace. Yeah, peace. To you, from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is not Paul saying hello from the Father and Jesus. This is not Paul saying, hey guys. The Father says hi, and so does Jesus. I think sometimes that's what we think is going on. That is not what's going on. Paul is pronouncing something here. In, in, uh, in the Jewish, in the language of the Hebrews, uh, their greeting would be shalom. And shalom isn't just saying hi. It's a pronouncement of peace. You are pronouncing peace. Shalom means peace be with you. You're pronouncing a statement that may peace be with you. It's a blessing. You're pronouncing a blessing. May peace be with you. Paul here is doing the same thing. And he's pronouncing grace in your life and peace in your life that comes from God and it comes from Jesus Christ. May that be with you. Not anxiousness. Not fear. What do you think would be the best way for people to be attracted to the message of the cross? You being anxious and fearful and worried and people see that in your life? Or if people see peace in your life? Or if people see peace and grace? Because you know that God has this and it's according to his wisdom, his will. Not your own. You don't, we don't tell God what to do. We don't suggest to God what he ought to do. We don't proclaim to God what he 
needs to do, we trust him as our Lord and Savior. And so we receive his grace and his peace into our lives. It comes from him. So that we're not anxious and we're not fearful. The answer is right there. He's pronouncing grace and peace to be with you. To replace fear and anxiousness and all the other things. Right? Let's wrap this up and try to pull together what we've talked about today. Okay? First and foremost, there is a calling. God has called. He sent out the message. The message of the cross. It's going out. He's not strategically calling. He did to Saul and Paul because he had a special mission. But then once the, once the gospel is being spread, that call is going out. It's just that it's being veiled by the God of this age. It's being veiled. There. He's blinding the eyes of the unbelievers. That's okay because God has something more powerful. Okay, He's the one that shines the light into their hearts. And he does it at the right time and in the right way, according to his wisdom, and not our own. Okay? God is doing these things. He is active. When we say things like God is in control, I mean, we really got to trust him that he is. And we got to trust that this is what he's doing. Okay? We're, our response, or anybody's response, is to call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is our Lord. To call on his name. To trust in him. Okay? And if we truly trust in him, we can let go some of these things. Worry and anxiousness. Because he gives us grace and peace. It comes from the Father. It comes from our Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord. He gives that to us. So that on our journey towards him, the journey toward being saved, we live this life of grace and peace. That's what he wants for you. Others, if you trust God, if you trust him, and if he is your Lord, you can say, I trust him with that. Is Jesus Lord? Is he sovereign over your life? Is he sovereign over others' lives? Look, Jesus has already done so much for everyone. And I, I think sometimes we miss that. Jesus on the cross, the message of the cross, is forgiveness. It is. Jesus has started something brand new, starting with forgiveness. And that applies to the world. It's just that the world has been blinded to this message. But when God shines that light into their hearts, and when they realize it's true and they respond, they respond by calling on the name of Jesus to be their Lord. Okay? Because forgiveness has come. Forgiveness is here. It's just that we respond by saying, you are my Lord. And if we trust God and say, yes, Jesus is my Lord, then we can live this life, this journey, without anxiousness. And we can trust him that it is by his wisdom, not ours, but his wisdom. He's going to shine the light into the world in his timing, his way, his method, not ours. That's the difference between our wisdom and the wisdom of God. The question is, do we trust his wisdom? Or would we rather take things into our own hands and say, well, no, God, I think you really need to do this. That's not Jesus Christ as Lord, okay? So I guess that's a little bit of a challenge to you. Let's let God do what he is very good at and let's trust him and let's live lives receiving the grace, receiving the peace from him so that others will see that light in our own lives. We receive the light and it begins to shine. Amen? Let's pray. Father, uh, we are just amazed every time we consider what you're doing and you certainly have done so much in our lives you're shining the light into our lives even right now and father 
we're receiving that and we're grateful for that and we're also receiving your grace and your peace so that we can live lives trusting you and we can just put our trust in and believe you and follow and father just give us that kind of confidence and that sureness in our lives so that we're not anxious and fearful father we know that your desire is to uh, to save the world and so we're just leaving that in your hands and we're just asking father that you would continue that and let us be part of it if that's your desire that we can be there for people when it's time for you to do that use us father even though we don't know what it looks like yet even though we don't know what you desire of us in the next moment father we want to surrender to you we want to surrender our lives to you and follow you wherever you take us we trust you and that makes Jesus our Lord and we give you praise today in the name of our Lord Jesus we pray amen amen Jesus is a is a good God is a good Lord gave up everything for you forgiveness redemption yeah new creation and a wonderful future